Help give kids an extra life by donating today to help sick and injured children. Link in the description and pinned comment below. No, Polybius was not a tool of the lolly lule lo. Get over it. When it comes to gaming and genres, you gotta do something to really stand out from the crowd. So, what's your plan? Make the story engrossing? Have a unique style of presentation? Go ham on the soundtrack? Yeah, all of those can go a long way toward making your game distinctive. And then there's the matter of gameplay. Genres are pretty well defined and their basic mechanics are pretty set in stone. At least that's what one might think. People have ways of making the tried and true mechanics of their game into something that's different. Of course, the more you stray from the norm, the further you drift into gimmick territory. Truth be told, however, that isn't always a bad thing. There are some interesting gimmicks out there that make their games better as a result, and that's what we're talking about today. Those unique mechanics that make the game more than just your bog-standard adventure. Now, I'm looking for gimmicks that are central to the game, and I'm looking at how these gimmicks make their game unique and interesting. So, let's break out of the boring. It's game time! I never thought I'd see the day where Nintendo of all companies would give up an IP to someone else. But then again, that IP was the wonderful 101, which A, is better off in the hands of Platinum Games anyway, and B, wasn't exactly a sales juggernaut. And that's a shame, because this game was awesome! I mean, controlling a team of 100 Power Rangers like they're Pikmin, what's not to like about that? And how exactly are you going to take on gigantic evil alien scum with such a huge team? Well, that's where the Unite Morph system comes into play. By combining their bodies through the unstoppable power of anime and tokusatsu logic, the Wonderful Ones are able to join together to form gigantic weapons to fight back against the Death Jerk forces. Each of the seven Unite Morphs has unique abilities both in and out of battle, and each is activated by drawing a different shape. It's like the Celestial Brush from Okami. If Okami were originally released on a platform that was designed for it. Yeah, the Wii U was a sales failure, but it wasn't for lack of trying. Whether you need a giant hand that can absorb fire, a sword that can reflect lasers, a gun that can suck in enemies, a whip which can deal with spiked enemies, a hammer that can crush enemy armor, a set of claws which can pry open enemy shields and climb on walls, or a bomb which is a localized time slow, you can assemble a tool for any situation with a gigantic mass of ranger bodies. And there's even a few special Unite Morphs for good measure. With this kind of power at their disposal, the Wonderful 101 can take on gigantic kaiju-sized threats without even needing a Megazord. And hey, they get a Megazord anyway, and in the final battles, they can combine robots to form a veritable Gigazord! Serial escalation taken to its logical extreme. Gotta love it. Nope, there's no point in getting away from this. The only way to escape is to ape. I'm not gonna claim that the N64 controller was a good one, but it did have one advantage over its competition. It was the first to have an analog thumbstick. This allowed for greater control than a D-pad could ever offer, and it was a big factor in the evolution of 3D gaming. But with PlayStation's dominance, Sony couldn't help but one-up Nintendo in the controller department. So what did they do? They made an updated version of their original controller, but added not one, but two analog sticks. Sony's DualShock controllers have been synonymous with the PlayStation brand since their debut, and changed controllers to the point where a controller is expected to have two analog sticks. While the right stick nowadays is most associated with camera control, when it first came out, Sony had something more inventive in mind. Ape Escape was created to show off this new controller technology, and had a unique control setup. While the left analog stick was used as expected for movement, the right analog stick was used to control all those awesome give-and-grabbing gear from your standard stun club and time net for capturing those pesky primates, to more clever weapons like the slingback shooter and the magic punch, to the really advanced tech like the RC car and the Skyflyer, all of them are controlled by the right stick in this series, and it makes for a surprisingly intuitive control scheme that fans of the series really came to love. So how do you control the camera in this game? Well, that was done using the control pad. 
You know, kind of like the Z buttons on the N64 controller. But a control scheme like this could only be done with the DualShock. The original Ape Escape was the first game to require the DualShock, and it's pretty clear why this game was the poster child for this new style of controller. And it's also pretty clear why Sony has stuck with this style of controller ever since. Of course, the Ape Escape homage level in Astrobot couldn't quite do this the same way, but eh, you can do what you can with what you have, right? All I can think is the guy who played the guy who invented Facebook. Who the f invented Facebook? Imagine if your friends on Steam actually gave you power. That's basically the brother band system from Mega Man Star Force in a nutshell. This system is an important component of the Star Force series, both in gameplay and in lore, even connecting back to the Battle Network series. In fact, in a side quest in Star Force 2, it's revealed that the inventor of the brother band system was none other than our favorite oversleeping net battler himself, Lan Hikari, to help people connect with one another like Lan was able to bond with Mega Man EXE. This way, people in the Star Force series, including our initially withdrawn protagonist, Geo, are able to connect with their friends, with brothers, gender neutral term in this series, by the way, being able to link instantly. Not only that, but brother bands can even be formed between entire planets, apparently. In terms of gameplay, forming new brother bands gives you actual in-game power. Forming friends with NPCs and other players gives you an edge in battle in the form of abilities and brother cards in the first game. It's especially useful to form brother bands with players of other versions, not only to access the other forms, but to gain special abilities as well. The system changed a bit in Star Force 2, introducing the concept of Link Power. With this new system, each brother on your list gave you a certain amount of Link Power, which in turn would increase your capacity for equipping ability waves to power yourself up even more. Link Power carries over into Star Force 3 with a few new features to boot. Not only will forming brother bands allow you to access more of the game's noise forms, but with the addition of the team system, up to seven players with the same team name can group up to give them even more power to work with after the main story has been completed. Honestly, this was one of my favorite ways to use the DS's online features, and with Star Force and Legends being the only Mega Man gens yet to get a Legacy Collection, I'd say it's less a matter of if we're getting a Star Force Legacy Collection, and more of a matter of when. Can't wait to destroy an evil alien invading force with the power of friendship and this battle card I found! Metal Gear has been no stranger to gimmicks. Case in point, Metal Gear Solid 3 has a number of smaller gimmicks that come into play throughout the mission, many of which will likely carry over into the remake. But if you're looking for something that's core to the game, let's talk about Metal Gear Rising Revengeance for a moment. Being a cyborg ninja with a rapidly vibrating sword, Raiden is more than well enough equipped to take on a deluge of enemies. And being a Platinum Games hack and slash means it's going to have a heavy element of style, with a gimmick to take advantage of that. And while Raiden's standard combos, both with his high-frequency blade and whatever weapons he's able to procure on sight, can do their fair share of damage on enemies, when you need the subtlety and precision of a master, that's where Blade Mode comes in. With Raiden's rebuilt body, he's able to use the energy in his fuel cells to enhance his reflexes to the point that time itself seems to slow down. Then, with his enhanced muscles, he can deliver lethal cuts and slashes to heck enemies into pieces. The game even tells you in some cases how many parts you've cut your enemy into. You can use the buttons for straight horizontal or vertical slashes, or you can use the right analog stick to cut at just the right angle. It's just so satisfying to cut a huge mech or an enemy aircraft in a metal scrap but even more satisfying is when you line up the perfect slash. When an enemy's weak point is revealed in blade mode, you can target that spot with your blade to perform a Zandatsu, tear out the enemy's fuel cell, and absorb its energy to refuel your own in a super satisfying finisher. If used wisely and judiciously, blade mode can be used continuously to take down a string of enemies, refilling your energy as you cut them down one by one. Not to mention, those precision cuts really come into play in the boss fights. In fact, while Raiden generally uses blade mode with his own HF blade, he can actually use it with any blade he can get his hands on, even the giant blade arm of Metal Gear Excelsis after he cuts it off, which he then uses to chop off the rest of its arms and shut down the giant spider man. Being a cyborg ninja really has its perks, although it's not something I want to go through myself. I'll stick to watching the mayhem from a distance. Rhythm Peripherals. Ever since Konami's Beat Mania first proved successful, and especially with the initial explosion of Dance Dance Revolution, there have been just about as many rhythm games with peripherals than without. Dance mats, guitars, taiko drums, bongos... Yeah, did you remember that the GameCube had bongos? 
And with so many peripherals, of course gamers have found plenty of ways to use them besides rhythm games. It's freaking crazy. But what if, and stay with me here, there was a platformer designed to be used with bongos? Yep, Nintendo is no stranger to gimmicks. In fact, I had to limit the number of Nintendo games on this list for the sake of balance. But one of their most interesting games was Donkey Kong Jungle Beat, a 2D platformer game that was designed to be played with nothing more than the bongos that came with Donkey Konga. So what, you gotta jump and attack along with the beat? Well, no, it's actually a lot simpler than that. The way you hit the bongos determines how DK moves in this game. Pitter-patter on the right drum, DK moves right. Pitter-patter on the left drum, DK moves left. Hit both drums at once, DK jumps. And then there's clapping, which is the game's primary non-movement action. Yeah, the game even uses the microphone in the controller. In fact, it uses the microphone a lot. Heck, you don't even have to clap, per se. You can just make any loud noise you want, like fire, 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 fire. And those simple controls give you all sorts of moves you can do to string together crazy combos to snatch up bananas, smash enemies, and rack up that score to get those sweet, sweet crests. Yeah, the crests are to blame for me repeating these stages again and again and again. And then there's the boss fights. It's one thing to repeatedly headbutt a giant bird's egg, smack warthogs with melons, and combat military elephants with explosive pineapples, but let's be honest, people who have played Jungle Beat know the real highlight of the game, the Kong battles. You're basically taking Punch-Out and playing it with the bongos. Dodging the boss Kong's attacks, countering with the punch, and then hammering those drums for all they're worth. While Donkey Kong Jungle Beat was a niche game on the GameCube, it was a novel and inventive platformer with a cool way of playing it. And true, it did get a new play control version on the Wii, except that version took away the bongo controls for something more standard and took away the main point of the game! Some games just need to be left alone. Even though a lot of big-name RPGs nowadays have become more focused on real-time action to the point that Final Fantasy itself has gone full hack-and-slash, there's still a place for some old-fashioned turn-based combat, as the menu-based format still continues to thrive. Of course, you gotta do something interesting with your battle system if you want to make it stand out, and one of the more interesting examples comes from Bravely Default. Originally released on the 3DS, this was a game that harkened back to the early days of Final Fantasy, with a few interesting twists of its own particularly its battle system. So, what's the typical format of a turn-based battle? You pick your action, your character does it, and then you move to the next one. Enemies take their turn, repeat the cycle until you either get wiped or you wring that precious golden EXP from the corpses of the enemies. Bravely Default decided to offer a system that offers more risk, but potentially more reward. The gimmick here takes itself from the game's very name. There are two parts to it, Brave Points and the Default Action. Each member of the party gains a Brave Point each turn, and as long as you start your turn with a Brave Point, you can take actions. I use the plural here, with each action costing a single Brave Point, because you can take up to four actions each turn, which can even cause you to accumulate what I call Brave Debt. As long as a character is in Brave Debt, you won't be able to use them until they're back in the black. And here's where the default action comes into play which is basically a fancy way of saying defend, with the added bonus of accumulating Brave Points as you do. So saving up Brave Points gives you more points to spend, making this whole system seem like a metaphor for financial responsibility. It adds a unique layer of strategy to battles, especially the harder ones. Do you go all in to try to wipe out enemies quickly, running the risk of leaving party members wide open to attacks if your strategy doesn't pan out? Or do you play the long game, taking that bit of chip damage and build up your Brave Points to unleash them all in a single devastating turn? If you play smartly and calculate your moves, you can turn battles into a flurry of crazy attacks from the job classes you've learned. And that's going to be important because some of these bosses are tough from what I've seen. It's a well-thought-out battle system that rewards careful forethought and knowing when to take a risk. And it's certainly more well-thought-out than the plot twist of having to fight the same four bosses four times! Seriously, whose idea was that? When you play many video games, particularly action-based games, you deal with hordes upon hordes of enemies. They're typically presented as nameless rank-and-file grunts, with the general exception of bosses. But have you ever thought about what kind of lives those enemies might have led? Those enemies were alive! For all we know, those grunts you've been slaughtering may have had names. Hell, they may have had families, hopes, dreams, ambitions. But no! You had to be the hero and cut them all down, you heartless monster! 
but while some games toy around with the idea, or talk about it in story, one series decided to bring this sort of question into the gameplay itself. Middle-Earth Shadow of Mordor and its sequel Shadow of War introduced a hierarchy to the forces of Mordor, and it's a living, breathing power structure known as the Nemesis System. This system gives weight to normal enemy encounters by giving Uruks a rank that can be affected by their interactions with the player and with one another. At the bottom of the ladder are common grunts that begin without names or anything of note. Above them are the Captains, which have names and unique traits, and also command small squads of grunts to fight alongside them. However, the Uruks are a living part of the environment, with missions of their own. The Uruks of Captain level or higher have their own names and titles which show their abilities. And by accomplishing certain feats, such as winning duels with other Uruks, succeeding in hunts, or, most notably, killing you or surviving an encounter with you, they can gain power and notoriety. The protagonist, Talion, can interact with these nemeses in various ways, such as dominating them in order to gain intel, interfering with their operations, and other methods depending on your playstyle. But death is not the end. For you, or for them. If you defeat a captain or war chief in battle, as long as they keep their head, they may return seeking revenge, making what would normally be a standard fight all that more personal. On the flip side, you may get a mission where you need to avenge the death of another player at the hands of a nemesis. And the nemesis system gains another layer in Shadow of War by including Uruks that are under Talion's command. You can command such Uruks to try to kill another captain, infiltrate an enemy's ranks, or simply train them to gain power. And when you get your first fortress, you can put your own Uruks against an opponent's forces in a battle for sweet loot. The Nemesis system is a novel way to make enemies something more than just fodder for you to kill by giving your enemies distinct identities, with various traits and even ambitions. Dare I say, it makes normal enemies seem like real characters. In all honesty, I wouldn't be surprised if there are people who wrote fanfics about them. Remember when Sony tried challenging Nintendo in the handheld market? Nowadays, more handheld PCs are trying to make a name for themselves in that space, with the Steam Deck being probably the biggest success that isn't the Switch. But for a couple of generations, Sony was giving it the old college try. In fact, the PSP, while not as big a seller as the DS, was still a success by most accounts. The Vita, on the other hand, while an impressive piece of hardware, no doubt, ended up bombing due to poor marketing, expensive accessories, and a general lack of support. Long story short, Sony basically gave up on it too soon. And that's a shame, because while its biggest promise, AAA Gaming on the Go, ended up falling short, there were some gems to be found on there, with Gravity Rush being among the most underrated titles on the system. This is the story of Cat, an amnesiac girl fighting to protect the city of Hexville from these strange beings called Nevi. While it is possible to fight weaker level Nevi with just some basic martial arts moves, that's not why the game is called Gravity Rush now, is it? While some games have played with gravity manipulation in the past with varying levels of success, this game takes it to a whole other level. Thanks to Kat's feline companion, she has the power to manipulate the forces of gravity around her as a gravity shifter. Her main action is altering her axis of gravity, and I mean in any direction you need. It effectively allows her to fly and walk on walls as long as her gauge holds out, which basically means that you can go anywhere you need to in the city, when you need to, with even more freedom than Spider-Man. This is used really effectively throughout the game in various challenges. She eventually also learns how to use this power to slide rapidly against walls and other surfaces. And yeah, flying around the city with gravity as your plaything is satisfying as hell, but this is also effective against the Nevi, because when you can change how gravity affects you, you can make down any direction you want and drive a powerful dive kick straight into an enemy's core, turning momentum into your most powerful weapon. And used wisely, you can chain several gravity kicks in succession to take down a swarm of Nevi one after another, and break through the stronger cores with one swift strike. Also, she has the power to create a stasis field in order to levitate objects and people around her, and while she does use it on occasion to safely transport allies or civilians, let's be honest, the satisfaction comes with taking and throwing objects at Nevi to smash them. With powers like this at someone's disposal, they could prove to be crazy powerful. So I guess it's a good thing that not just anyone can be a shifter. There's a bunch of story reasons for that. Still, the ability to have the power of gravity at your fingertips? That's some Omega-level mutant business right there. If there's one system that could be considered the gimmick hive, it would be the Game Boy. 
because while games can always have gimmicks built into their programming, the portable nature and cartridge-based format of the Game Boy allows for gimmicks to be built into the game packs themselves. We've seen Kirby's Tilt and Tumble with, uh, well, tilt controls as an early predecessor to the Wii, Rumble games like Pokemon Pinball and Drill Dozer, and perhaps the most unique one of all, an underrated GBA series known as Boktai. Boktai is a series from Konami about fighting vampires. If I had a nickel for every time that two nickels meme was appropriate, I'd have enough money to take over the tri-state area myself. Boktai was also a series that was created by none other than Hideo Kojima. You see what I'm talking about here? Although to be fair, Kojima's involvement in Rising wasn't actually that much. Now, unlike Castlevania, you aren't playing as a big shot Belmont with a sacred whip. Instead, you're armed with a gun that channels the power of Vampire's one true weakness, our own wonderful sun. The Solar Gun, or Gun del Sol as the game so eloquently names it, fires concentrated solar power to fry the undead to a pile of ashes. But the battery can only hold so much before you gotta juice it up again. So, how do you charge it? Well, you do have items that can do that, but Kojima's madness led to the inclusion of a solar sensor in the game's cartridge itself. That's right, by going outside in daylight, or at least by a window which gets sunlight, you can power your hero Django by guiding him to a skylight to charge up your gun's battery with actual, real-world sunlight. Oh, uh, are you okay, Django? Looking a little juiceless there. Let me step outside for just a moment. There you go, let me charge you up. Oh, better be careful not to get too much, don't want you to overheat. Oh, that coffin looks heavy. What's that? There's a vampire trying to get out of it? Want me to help you take care of that? No problemo. Time to fire up the pile driver. Let's send that monster back to the pits of hell. You see what I'm talking about? There is no way a console or PC could ever do this. Of course, yeah, it is a bit limiting, seeing that it does require sunlight, but it's still a unique way for the real world to interact with your game. You could even hook up a Boktai cartridge into the DS with Lunar Nights to bring the Solar Sensor gameplay into that game as well. Not to mention that the Solar Gun showed up in Mega Man Battle Network as well as Metal Gear Solid 4, albeit without the need for actual sunlight. And fun fact! Originally, Kojima wanted to include a breath sensor as well. Obviously, that wouldn't have worked for reasons too obvious to list, but you know one thing that hurts vampires, right? Yeah, garlic. Man, that would make Wario more dangerous than ever. Chomp down on some garlic and a whole room of undead would just be dead again, you know? And before we move on, here are some honorable mentions. The Targeting Sphere from Vagrant Story. Maybe that's where Fallout got the idea for the VAT system. Echoes from The Legend of Zelda Echoes of Wisdom. Yeah, wait till I tell my friends in the Shire that I killed a rock monster with a sea urchin! The Trigger System from Schwarzer Blitz. Interesting resource system in an interesting indie fighting game. The Celestial Brush from Okami, saving the world one brush stroke at a time. And the VR camera from Lucky's Tale. What do you know? Third person games can work on VR. And now let's see what the Arcade Nation has to say with this month's patron picks. My pick would be the Mood Matrix from Dual Destinies. Not only does it add a fun new layer to cross examinations, it even acts as another character for Athena to bounce off of. Thousand Arms is a very interesting game on PS1, in which it has dating sim mechanics that actually impact how you play the game. By that, I mean that as a spare blacksmith, you can forge your party's weapons, and depending on your intimacy with the various ladies throughout the game, you give additional spells, unique special attacks, and different elemental affinities. You should do this often so that your armory is never dull. I would have to pick the Pain and Thinner gimmick from Epic Mickey as my favorite gimmick. I love the way the puzzles are designed around it, and the way combat can change depending on what kind of paint you use. You know you've got something real special on your hands when you're able to seamlessly blend two different genres into a unique and engaging experience. Remember when I talked about the rise of rhythm games earlier? With all those peripherals and stuff? Well, this isn't about peripherals, but the way music translates to gameplay, with keeping the beat essential to success. From games like Guitar Hero, to indie hits like Crypt of the Necrodancer, and more. The hack and slash genre is its own kind of special, stringing together blow after blow and cutting enemies to bits while looking as stylish as possible, racking up those awesome combos and getting all those cool effects. So what do you think happens when... Last year's breakout hit, Hi-Fi Rush, literally dropped out of nowhere and took the world by storm. The misadventures of Chai and his ragtag band of rebels charmed audiences with a fun cast of characters, a killer set list of both licensed tracks and original riffs, 
and an art style that was honestly a breath of fresh air in a AAA landscape that seems obsessed with how many pores we can see on our main character's nose in a first-person game. Nah, bruh, stop sweating details that the average gamer won't even notice, and focus on what actually matters. But let's not distract ourselves from what's really taking center stage here. Even if it were just a hack and slash, you still have tight action with hard-hitting combos and well-executed platforming. Not to mention, the special moves are tight as hell. But what makes Hi-Fi Rush so special is how the game turns everything into a rock concert by combining hack and slash with a rhythm game. So our wannabe rock star accidentally gets a music player embedded in his chest and now everything around him moves to the beat of the music. Yep, cut it, print it, move to full production! I have no idea how nobody came up with this idea sooner. Everything moves to the beat, from enemy attacks to environmental obstacles, and if you can feel the rhythm, you've got the touch and the power to make the world your captive audience. Putting the literal beat in beat down, beat combos give power to your sense of rhythm, making every hit feel like a crescendo of fury, every dodge feel like perfect choreography, and every parry feel like a bass drop right onto the malevolent robot's heads. It's like a music video come to life as you make your way across Vandalay's corporate dungeons with a song of victory driving you forward, every platform playing to your beat, and every enemy just an instrument to be played with your literal axe made of scrap. Hell, it even makes quick time events feel fun, which in itself is an accomplishment. It's a blending of genres that's so unique and engaging, it's no wonder that this game shot up the charts. This is more than simply a gimmick. It's a revolution of creativity that, if I'm perfectly being honest here, the world needs more of. Tango Gameworks made a masterpiece with this game, and with Krafton picking up their pieces after Bethesda and Microsoft so callously shattered them, we can only wonder, who will they do for an encore? After all, in a world like this, creativity is more important than ever. While it's true that not every idea is going to work, you're never going to find the ones that do if you don't at least try. And when every project is scrambling to get noticed, the greatest risk is not taking one at all. I'm the Quarter Guy, and until next time, the arcade is closed. Now, there is a spin up I didn't talk about, but I only have so much time in the video before it starts to drag. But on the plus side, I know a guy who loves that spin up as much as I do. Sadly, that person is now retired, so I guess it's up to me. Hey everyone, QG here! If you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, and share the video around! Feel free to check out my Blue Sky and Twitch streams, and consider supporting me through Patreon, and donating to my Extra Life campaign to support Children's Wisconsin. Thanks for watching!